I'll begin this afternoon session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Forestry's National Electronic Lecture Program. My name is Sharon Young, and I will be hosting today's session. Today is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024, and this is the sixth session in the lecture series entitled Sharing Knowledge on Some Key Initiatives Happening Across the Canadian Forest Service. The series is brought to you by the Canadian Forest Service and Canadian Wood Fiber Centre. The CIF IFC is very pleased to collaborate and host these webinars. For today's session, we're very pleased to have Danny Degenhardt, who will give an exciting presentation titled Multi-Source Remote Sensing Data Fusion for Wild Site Reclamation Monitoring. To kick things off, Danny is a reclamation research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service. She is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta. She received a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Alberta and a Master of Science and a PhD in soil science from University of Saskatchewan. Currently, she is working with a team of multidisciplinary researchers to develop rec reclamation techniques and technologies to accelerate the creation of sustainable forest ecosystems posing industrial disturbances. With that, I will now pass it over to Danny. Thank you, Sharon. Um, yes, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Hopefully it's going to be exciting, no promises. Um, I Before I begin, I just wanna say that um, I'm sharing this presentation with Xiao Xin. Um, who's in the room with me, and um, and Xiaoxin and Dimitro are truly the brains behind this operation. Um, when I embarked on this project three years ago, I, I would say that I had a very rudimentary understanding of what remote sensing is and how it can be applied to reclamation monitoring or monitoring of young trees. And so, yeah, I'm really happy to be where we are today and hopefully... Um, can share some of our learnings with the rest of you. Um, so I'll start the presentation. Um, so the project is funded through Office of Energy Research and Development. So the focus is really looking at well site monitoring, um, but that's not to say that the technology that we're developing here can't be applied to other initiatives like the Two Billion Trees. Um, so really the, the crux is that we're trying to monitor young trees and small trees in a very complex ecosystem, such as well sites that are recently reclaimed. Um, so uh, some context in terms of well sites in Alberta, for those of you who are not familiar, um, we, we do have a lot of well sites here. <laughs> um, and a large portion of it is still active and some are inactive and some are abandoned. But a lot of these well sites will at some point get reclaimed in their lifetime. And um, that's over 88,000 of them. And most well sites are about one hectare in size. And so that's a large amount of area, especially in the boreal forest alone um, that we're seeing in terms of these disturbance footprints. And when it comes to reclaiming well sites um, from a forested land perspective, we do follow a reclamation criteria set out by the government of Alberta. Um, so this part of that criteria is looking at veg assessment and the landscape and soil. Um, however, the, the assessment is really done on a very small portion of that well site. So less than 1% of the whole entire or one hectare area. And the veg assessment is quite simple in terms of what is required. Um, a lot of times it's looking at percent cover of the woody species versus the herbaceous species and the planted and the unplanted stems and shrub count. Um, and it's often comparing to an offsite. So you have the onsite, which is really nine plots versus four plots offsite. You're really trying to look at differences between the on and offsite. And so when I started thinking about this three years ago, the idea was, can we use remote sensing to improve our current reclamation monitoring? 
not to replace it, but to really enhance it. And I think remote sensing really stands out um, as a possible solution because it provides that wall-to-wall -wall vegetation data comparing to the traditional boots on the ground plot sampling. It certainly allows you to have that more comprehensive and representative data for the entire one hectare site. And we also know that remote sensing data is more objective and not subjective to the person doing the veg assessment. Therefore, it's repeatable and more visual and transparent, which allows the auditing process to uh, maybe expand to the small portion of sites that are currently being audited by the Alberta Energy Regulator. And so there are different types of sensors in remote sensing and, and the two that we're really focusing on is LIDAR and multispectral. Um, so we, we set out with a few research objectives and really it's to look at the application of using remote sensing sensors and technology to assess vegetation recovery on um, disturbances and this focus mostly on well sites, but certainly you can expand this to any restoration landscape or footprint um, like seismic lines or the oil sands. Um, and here we're using um, UABs to monitor veg recovery um, for this particular project on well sites. And there's certainly a set of unique challenges with forested well sites. We're looking at small trees, mixed species with you know, complex understory canopy. And our goal is really to find that user-friendly open source software and data processing pathway. And specifically, we're developing this workflow that will eventually be automated um, to look at tree delineation and height extraction. And we're hoping to really finesse in terms of that accuracy on some of the vegetation variables and parameters that we're monitoring. So really trying to improve that current accuracy and comprehensiveness. And so we have um, our, our own uh, drone and sensors and um, we purchased the sensors two years ago and it was the L1 DJI Zenmoose, which is already obsolete. That just shows how quickly technology is moving. Um, we have the MicaSense Red Edge P for the multispectral sensor. And when we started this project in 2023, um, I know Karen's in the audience. I, I remember just one day popping over to say, hey, let's let's try this at a tree nursery site. Cause we were struggling to find sites with really small trees for um, doing our model testing. And so, um, there was a Christmas tree farm that was 30 minutes away from Edmonton. So it became kind of our test site. We call it our tree nursery test site. Um, it has a range of deciduous and conifer species uh, with heights varying from 0.5 meter to 2.3 meters. So that kind of became our jumping point into um, a lot of the work in 2023. And we also partnered with Nate on um, flying some of the legacy well sites uh, near Grand Prairie. So these well sites are certified, reclaimed 20 plus years previously, and then was retreated again by Weyerhaeuser between 2007 to 2009 to promote conifer leading force. As these particular well sites um, were reclaimed to an older standard, so they were predominantly graminoids rather than tree species. And so um, so they've been retreated by Weyerhaeuser and then now we're looking at you know the status of these sites. So Amanda's team from Nate Boreal Research Institute at Nate did all the ground vegetation monitoring and we um, kind of partnered with them and flew these sites. And uh, yeah, so these sites are um, mostly white spruce, lush pole pine with the mix of poplar and aspen, the height um, of these trees range from, you know, three meters to about four meters tall. So the data pre-processing um, was done using licensed software. And this is kind of the constraint of, you know, this work is a lot of the post-processing work we do is using open source software, but the pre-processing um, because of licensing reasons and simplicity reasons and a 
lot of the conventional ways is, is usually done using license software. So for, for a LIDAR, we use DJ Terra. Um, for the multispectral data, we use Pix4D. And we are in the process of developing this automated workflow that really helps maximize the potential of using drone-based remote sensing technology and artificial intelligence. And that's something that we're really embarking on and it's really new and I, I, I think it's groundbreaking. Um, because our aim for this technology is really to function at three distinct levels or scales. So at the plot level, um, what we're hoping to do is that the remote sensing technology will differentiate between the different classes of very, uh, vegetation, tree, shrubs, ground, understory. And on the individual tree level, the drone LiDAR will gather inventory attributes such as height, location, species, and on the broader scale, we want to integrate this data from multispectral um, data that we collect, as well as multi temporal and larger area source data, such as we can enhance a lot of the capacity in terms of these bolded areas um, that I have here on the slide. Um, and really, the outcome is that we were able to deliver this workflow and create um, attributed 3D point clouds and 2D detail maps and a comprehensive summary table of all the vegetation variables and attributes that we're able to monitor and aggregate them across spatial and temporal dimensions. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to um, Xiao Jing and he will kind of take you through his model and what he's done so far. Thank you, Ray. Okay, uh, thank you, Danny, for the great introduction. I hope it can be long, longer. <laughs> but anyway, like uh, we can continue with uh, uh, some of our work. Um, uh, basically, um, like my idea is to employ as much as AI technology to help with uh, monitoring, especially in terms of the automation solutions. So um, we can look at the uh, slides here. Um, um, I want to first mention that it's not me, but uh, also my colleague Dimitro is working on the, this project. And uh, um, this work involves into a traditional remote sensing solution based on the like multispectral and the uh, textual features from the uh, 2D raster image and to classify those uh, tree uh, area. And uh, uh, there are some interesting results from this uh, research. And uh, you, just using the uh, tree nursery test site, we can see that uh, in some areas with uh, low vegetation, um, uh, the traditional um, crown height model-based uh, solution uh, will sometimes uh, underestimate those small trees. You can see the detection rate from that, uh, you know, yellow point, uh, yellow points. Uh, many of the small trees are missing, uh, so the detection rate is about uh, thirty-seven percent in that area. But this incorporation of the multispectral features. And the, based on the deep learning model, uh, sorry, based on the machine learning model, can increase this uh, detection, detection rate from 37 to 95 percent. So that means the multispectral information is very important in terms of the uh, short tree detection. And the, my intuition is that uh, we also need to incorporate to the 3D because the 2D raster needs a lot of 2D structural information. So my purpose is, is to uh, directly use the uh, 3D point clouds as input then uh, and use that to classify the tree areas. And we found that uh, the detection rate can also be improved uh, from 37% to 89%, uh, which is great. Uh, so that means uh, structure information is also important. And how to combine those structure and special information will be done in the future. But my work is more like uh, going through the 3D solution and that you pave the way to, for the, this um, you know, advanced technology. And to be honest, like uh, tree detection is not that difficult uh, since we have a handful of um, model to use. But uh, in order to go move forward for individual tree identification, uh, the task will be much uh, more difficult. Um, so um, in, in, to be honest, uh, we, we just developed a brand new uh, deep learning model based on the 3D diffusion uh, algorithms uh, inspired by the recent uh, generative AI algorithm. Uh, so this algorithm uh, has been tested uh, from a lot of uh, compressed UAV scans and from 
open source data set. So uh, you can briefly see that all oh, um, looks like um, basically it will kind of um, cluster those trees into small dots and then do the segmentation afterwards. So um, uh, we, I, we just want to explain the detail and the directly see the results here. So uh, here we can sh uh, show the two different sites, the test nurseries, and sorry, the tree nursery test site and the our, one of our well sites 262. And uh, you can see those trees as after segmentation has been uh, rendered in different colors. And uh, so we can identify each trees clearly, usually. So um, we see that uh, for the nursery test site, um, the traditional um, deep learning method, uh, mass assaying, um, can work well, and, the, and also our depth of net model. And, but for the more complex uh, uh, tree, uh, tree sites with the varying tree heights and the tree density, um, the mass assaying uh, benchmark uh, drops to an accuracy of about uh, 0 0.4, but our um, depth of net um, can remain the accuracy high, uh, like that to be 0 0.72. So um, the benefit of using the uh, test uh, test site is we can go to the ground and grab the ground truth measurement. So um, basically we just measured about two, uh, 300 trees and their heights and uh, compare it with uh, the tree heights extracted from our um, uh, tree segment models. Uh, we can uh, see that the root mean square error is about uh, 41 centimeter, which is about uh, uh, super great, but still a, a good result compared to the other studies. And uh, we can move further to see the scatter plot uh, comparing the uh, our extract tree height with uh, ground truth measurement. Uh, we can see uh, some uh, interesting pattern uh, that um, our uh, extract tree height is uh, consistently higher than the ground truth measurement. So um, we expect that uh, very typical for the UAV LIDAR because uh, sometimes uh, the LIDAR will uh, miss the tree top and the tree ground detection. That will cause a systematic error of the tree height extraction. Um, so um, this is one interesting uh, conclusion. And using our um, ground truth data, we can also see how good uh, how well is our tree detection algorithm? And we can see that um, the overall uh, detection rate is about 0 0.7, uh, sorry, 0 0.95. Um, but when we just uh, split those uh, into different height classes, just like uh, the histogram in the middle shows, um, we can see the detection rate varies greatly with the uh, tree height. So we bind the tree heights into different classes. And the and most of the tree, tree heights uh, above 0 0.6 uh, is about a hundred percent detection rate. But uh, for the trees uh, smaller or shorter than 0 0.6 meter in height, then we can see a drastic um, drop into the detection accuracy. That means uh, the algorithms of, of our dip of net um, can have some problems in detecting extremely small trees. And so we will consider the future solution, like either to acquire a new sensor, uh, the AO2 um, sensor that can bring about a much better precision of points, or we can um, add uh, multiple special features as uh, my, my colleague Dimitri suggested, so to improve the detection of those small trees. And so we just finished the, uh, I mean, the benchmarking using our test site. Um, we also have our well sites uh, that's more complex, and uh, we cannot really measure all the trees um, in, in the, that site. And there are around uh, 1,400 trees located in within that small uh, one hectare area. So, um, um, but in uh, alternatively, um, we just um, isolated those trees manually from the point cloud, and regarding this as our, our reference to you know to benchmark or validate our tree detection and tree isolation algorithm. And uh, you can see those uh, histogram uh, uh, from the menu reference uh, from our depth of net and from the mass size name. And then we can see uh, some interesting phenomena here, definitely. Um, so one of the most obvious uh, phenomena is that uh, for the trees um, that is shorter than 60 centimeter in height, um, there's a lot of over detection uh, of those trees. So you can see the middle uh, plot 
and there was a really high birth uh, at the beginning. And, but uh, away from those short trees, or all those material trees, uh, or I mean the more growing trees, then we will see that the distribution of heights uh, is uh, quite similar to that distribution from the manual reference, which means uh, our type of models uh, can capture the general uh, distribution from the our well site. And compared to that distribution from the mass assay, we can see uh, that model really under uh, detect a lot of trees. You can see the bar, the height of the bar is quite low <laughs> compared to the reference, and the shape of the histogram is also different. So um, this uh, test gives us some credit that um, we can rely on our diff of net model uh, to do the tree isolation and the detection. Then uh, we can apply our models uh, to a more uh, a realistic or more practical size. So this is uh, uh, well we applied our uh, trained uh, model to size 262. And uh, um, we move further to uh, do the species classification, basically um, classify those individual trees into the deciduous conifers and the, those small trees. And we select the threshold of 60 centimeter because that uh, is the uh, area zone like based on our previous slide. And then uh, we can uh, compare, uh, sorry, we can extract uh, some important information, uh, including the individual tree height and the tree individual tree uh, crown area, and the, also the compositions of uh, those uh, tree types. And then uh, that was required by the recommendation criteria. And we can see that uh, histogram uh, in the middle from this slide. And, and the overall detection accuracy, uh, sorry, the species classification accuracy is around uh, 87% for deciduous and uh, for the, uh, sorry, the 88% for the coniferous trees, which is not bad, uh, but we want to improve that by incorporating multispectral features. And uh, uh, my colleague uh, Brooke is working on that, uh, adding more reference for that too. Thanks for all those efforts. Um, so previous, uh, all the previous slides uh, tell us one uh, thing that uh, we, our model can be um, uh, reliable for tree segmentation and the species classification. So we can move forward to apply the models uh, to all of the five sites uh, uh, we have. And the, uh, for each site, we have a leaf on and the leaf off scans, uh, one in summer, the other in autumn. And uh, um, we apply that model to create those individual uh, 3D point clouds and we can uh, extract all those uh, parameters or tree attributes, just like the table here, and compare their difference between the leaf on and leaf off conditions. And uh, uh, the first thing uh, we notice that uh, those trees extracted from the leaf on and the leaf off uh, has not much difference uh, visually. That means our model can produce consistent tree identification results, so which is great. And the second thing is that uh, when we look at the tree heights, we found that uh, there is not much difference in during the leaf on and leaf off conditions. So that also confirms that um, we we our models can extract uh, like those trees uh, in a stable ways. So we need to look at those um, I mean comparisons more in, in more detail uh, by extracting those um, variables and comparing them between those uh, tree types. So this is what the slide shows us. Um, we, we can uh, this is the average uh, from all our sites, and uh, we divide that into the conifers and the deciduous and the, those small trees below 60 centimeter in height. And uh, from this bar chart, we can clearly compare how they look, uh, how they are different uh, in the leaf on the leaf off conditions. And uh, um, you can just look at the, in the, the middle that uh, we found that. Uh, the height uh, between uh, leaf on and leaf off is almost uh, similar uh, um, for the deciduous conifers and the other trees. Uh, this is uh, tells us two good things. The first thing is um, our model is consistent, as we said. The second thing that uh, we don't need to bother like scanning the sites like frequently or like every two months in order to uh, detect the height trends because there is a very slight height trend in our well sites. Uh, that can be uh, ignorable, like uh, in, in continuous two seasons. Um, but when we look at uh, the tree counts and the crown areas, uh, there can be a huge difference. 
we can see the first uh, bar chart. Um, the tree count um, from the deep oak trees uh, is much greater than that from the deep oak trees, and uh, uh, especially uh, for the uh, conifers trees. That means um, there is a lot of probably there may, may be a lot of trees uh, detected from that season, um, and uh, also for the crown areas we can see a lot of uh, increase of crown area during the leaf on season. This is quite understandable. Um, so I'm not saying that uh, like this model is 100% accurate or perfect. So because we only get five sites and we only have the um, measurement of like these basic inventory attributes. Um, so the question is that whether those same uh, conclusions can apply to a bigger area or to a longer time trajectory. This is what the monitoring purpose uh, falls on. So um, because of the limitation of the drones, we only have uh, just one year's uh, flight and uh, it's just a snapshot of the, I mean, of the tree conditions uh, last year in 2013. So um, we are more interested in see that whether those trends uh, keep the same, whether the tree height uh, like growth is ignorable, like from a long term. So uh, this requires us to move forward to a larger areas and also to a, like a longer time trajectory. So how to do that? Um, so um, we will consider the, the satellite image as the most stable uh, data source to help us understand this you know, annual trend. And we have uh, the Sentinel-2 imagery that has uh, almost uh, um, 13 bands uh, useful for such kind of monitoring. Um, and uh, um, we also have the polygons uh, from the Alberta Human Footprint Monitoring Program in 2019. And the, uh, that polygons tells us like it's about 13, uh, 3,000 3, abandoned wells uh, within the area near the Grand Prairie. And uh, there are um, like more, more, more numbers of wells, almost about 9,000 9, active wells uh, located in that area. So this is not a, a ignorable number in terms of the size of uh, the number of wells. And then we can uh, plot the wells yields uh, for both types of wells. And then we can see that a lot of wells uh, have been there for around for more than uh, 20 or 30 years. So uh, we need to start looking at those growths from that wells, I mean, 20 years ago. So that, that really creates a lot of new challenges too. Um, Interesting, we can use uh, um, the uh, MVVI index, uh, that is basically the greenness of the vegetation uh, from the Sentinel-2 imagery. And we can track this uh, MVVI change throughout uh, the years. And I, uh, here is an example uh, that, uh, more, uh, sorry, that plot those uh, yearly changes, oh, sorry, the monthly changes of the MVVI across the uh, years from 2016 and until uh, last year. And uh, uh, you can see uh, those curves uh, representing the mean values of each month. And uh, the gray bars uh, representing the uh, standard deviation within that month. So uh, it's, it's very straightforward that we can see those uh, seasonal fluctuation of the MDVI uh, for both the abandoned uh, well sites and the active well sites. And the, it's also very straightforward that uh, those MDVI from the uh, abandoned well sites uh, is consistently higher than those from the active well sites in blue. And it's, uh, uh, I think that this is a very, uh, it makes sense because those trees from the abandoned sites grows uh, probably like this have larger coverage than those uh, active well sites. But it's more interesting to note that um, the MDVI value um, is trending throughout uh, those years. It's especially we noticed a drastic drop in the last two years. Uh, when we see that in peak value of the MDVI for the last two uh, curves, we can see that uh, the, the previous years we, we have a very consistent uh, MDVI, but it uh, drops suddenly in the recent two years. Um, so um, this is what the MDVI tells us. And uh, uh, this also applies to our five well sites uh, as plotted as in the radar chart here. Uh, we can see those kind of uh, circular plot and uh, um, the years uh, as the 
for example, sorry, as the X uh, axis uh, increased cross clockwisely from the 2016 to the last year. And we can also see the seasonal variation and the, the uh, I mean, the trench and the drop of the NDVI peaks in the last two years for our five sites. And uh, this is quite interesting. Like, uh, probably it's, uh, we cannot justify what's the reason behind that, but uh, it's really interesting to keep on monitoring those changes of the vegetation, uh, especially in the uh, most recent years. And uh, um, but we want to point out from here that uh, the NDVI uh, can tell us a lot of information about the tree health and tree greenness, but we are more interested in to the tree heights and the canopy fraction and the tree density. Those uh, attributes required by the monitoring criteria. So how does NDVI uh, be correlated to the criteria we have? Um, so we can see those uh, bar charts on, on the left. Um, that can tell a little bit of story from that. Um, basically, um, we see that the tree height density and the kind of fraction has a strong correlation with the yields since recognition. That means uh, the tree ghost can be identified or indicated by those tree height uh, increase. But for the NDVI, uh, the correlation uh, is uh, quite low. It's around 0 0.1. So that means that the growth pattern might not be strongly indicated by the NDVI value uh, alone. We need to really think about uh, how to convert those uh, uh, special index into the variables we are interested in to fit the requirement of uh, recommendation criteria. So the, uh, the good thing is that our drone data can be overlapped with uh, the Sentinel satellite image. So that brings us some bridge or linkage between those two data sets, and we can fuse those two data sets to provide us some you know, uh, predictions from our drone variables. So that is what we, we are doing. Um, we have uh, our well sites from the Sentinel-2 imagery extracted from the Google Earth engine. And uh, um, we extract the, the 16 bands from that, uh, all, all, all our well sites. Um, for, <clears throat> and then um, we, we also have a drone based uh, variable extracted uh, from the LiDAR and uh, from the our tree uh, models. Uh, we use a deep learning model and uh, to, I mean, that can connect those satellite special information with the variable we extracted from Jones. So this is one way of the upscaling. And we hope those um, regression model can help us to understand the longer time trajectory change of the two variables. And this is the example from, um, uh, the, sorry, the radar plot from our five sites. And that's the uh, uh, inference from the uh, deep learning model. Um, like first one is uh, tree height, uh, monthly mean, the second one is the tree uh, crown area, and this, the last one is the stem density. So um, it doesn't tell anything right now because we haven't started to uh, validate them yet. But it's very interesting to see that uh, for the first graph, the tree height um, is it's quite smoother than those other variables. Um, so that is really intuitive because the tree goes uh, much slower or much milder than the other variables, uh, which uh, may have the seasonal var uh, variations. But for the second one, like for the crown area and the, for the um, uh, tree density, uh, those have uh, clear you know, seasonal fluctuations from the plot. So this is a really uh, good uh, hint to us that the deep learning regression can capture those uh, difference between the variables. Then we can apply that uh, with more uh, with, with higher uh, reliability for the other variables and other sites, but still, we need to increase uh, the sampling from our sites, and we want to uh, to refine our models based on more um, based on more ground measurement. So this is uh, I don't know if Danny wants to wrap up. <laughs> okay, so uh, it, yeah, it leaves to me like uh, we want to do a, little, a lot more future work in order to uh, uh, perfect our models and our framework. I want to mention that our purpose is not simply just uh, uh, to provide a certain kind of uh, research findings, but also to, uh, you know, to help uh, the first researchers, provide them with uh, uh, useful tools. And after we trained our models um, with sufficient sampling from the ground, then uh, it's all, all possible to automate them into a workflow, starting from the tree detection, 
tree identification uh, up all the way up to the tree conservation and the upscaling. And then, um, um, but the, the, the bad thing is that uh, it's still very limited uh, for our data set. Um, we still need to, um, you know, have a lot of groundwork, including to uh, buy a new sensor uh, for, uh, for better height extraction. And we saw also need to uh, a lot of uh, model like benchmarking in order to optimize that deep learning models. And finally, we also want to upscale our data to a larger area with the help of Sentinel-2. So all of them uh, seems a very long-term project to work with. And uh, but finally, we want, we hope that all, all those efforts can pay off uh, because um, the AI is kind of developing so rapidly, and uh, it's a really good timing for us to consider like. Uh, using these methods to help with our understanding of uh, tree or you know recommendation monitoring, and that is uh, yeah, our final uh, pursuit. And thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, just show it to me. Thank you. Thank you, Danny and Zhou Xing. Um, before we proceed to answer the questions, let's take a moment to answer the post webinar survey. So I'm just gonna launch it in a second. Just a reminder, there are two questions in total. You may need to scroll down to see the next question. Okay, uh, um, yeah. Okay, I saw uh, several questions. Thanks for being involved. and. Uh, um, giving uh, it, it is from the Chris Bader. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, giving the improvement of tree detection uh, when incorporating multi spectral data, can you simply use uh, image derived photometric uh, point clouds for structural and uh, drop LIDAR entirely? Um, yeah, I think uh, this is uh, a question also uh, we, we are considering highly. And uh, we, we think that uh, the, uh, it's probably much easier to incorporate the multi uh, based on the photometry because those are from the imagery too. And it's, uh, the fusion of those different data sources uh, can be applied to technical problems. And I, I appreciate that uh, those work has already been done in the past and a lot of work is based on the 2D rasters. So we need to think about how to, uh, you know, seamlessly uh, incorporate our work into the uh, more, you know, conventional solutions. And, and in terms of my uh, answer is, um, I think uh, um, I would like to think about uh, to fuse those multi spectral directly into the 3D point cloud. And uh, um, this can be done by uh, geo, geo referencing and uh, you know, image staging. And, uh, although there's no uh, automatic way of achieving this, uh, this goal, uh, but we are starting using some of the uh, different models to help with that. Then uh, we can have a totally you know, multi spectral point cloud. Uh, that both have the special information and the structure information uh, for us to do the uh, following work. And uh, um, I think uh, uh, so far, like Dimitri is working on the other branch, like what you suggested, like uh, uh, incorporating those uh, image derived uh, photometry point clouds and uh, also uh, incorporating the multi spectral data because there are less, pro a few problems of you know, integration and uh, you know, data quality problems. Um, Probably this can be go either ways, um, but we are working towards two directions right now. Um, I, I just want to like say hello and <laughs> to have a short a reach out so so people can pay attention to the three D domain. Okay, this is great. Okay, the second question. Okay, um, I saw it from um, yeah anyone who can, um, who is interested, and the, um, it's about why do you think multi spectral imagery would improve the tree conservation accuracy? especially the small trees. Uh, the special responses of a small tree and the surrounding vegetation can be very similar. Okay, yeah, this is a really a trick question and uh, I really appreciate you mentioning that. And when you look deep into those uh, plot level and uh, those you know, details, there are endless you know, uh, problems. We cannot have a really good or perfect models that can help with that. So it's, the purpose is only to help us for general or rough um, you know, reduction of the processing, but the final uh, refinement of models requires a lot of uh, efforts. I think uh, for the uh, small trees um, from our data, uh, we can see the difference uh, clearly from the multi spectral image. 
because uh, the resolution of the multi spectral uh, form of John LIDAR is around, like, it's quite high, like within three, uh, like 10 centimeter resolution. So um, we, we did see a lot of uh, difference of small trees and surroundings. Um, but uh, this is also the question, like uh, for some trees with a smooth surface, especially uh, for the shrub, um, it's definitely too hard to find the location of the trees. So in that way, um, we will consider using hybrid way to describe those kind of data sets. For example, we can consider those parts as a general like continuous service. So we want to really identify each individual small trees in that areas. And we, we consider the high uh, concerning in that areas. So we will treat it differently. So this is a more practical answer to me. The other thing is uh, probably we can, you know, uh, max out the ability of the Jones and the multi version point clouds in order to see the difference between the neighboring small trees. Probably this can be done by using a better LiDAR data, uh, but it, the answer should be, be given to the future development of the sensors. Okay, so um, I don't know if you satisfied with the answer. Uh, for the next question, um, can you explain uh, more about the confusion between the vegetation and small trees and possible solutions? Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, um, yeah, we didn't really ex uh, provide a lot of uh, explanation about the, the error zones <clears throat> for those uh, small trees in the area. Uh, I guess uh, it might be the data quality problems, or it, it can be the uh, the problem of the, um, yeah, <clears throat> of the, uh, the tree types. I mean, there is a complexity of the nature, you know, so uh, we need to investigate uh, a create a conversion matrix uh, and to see like uh, which area or whether it's because of the tree height or because of the density of trees or overlapping of trees. So that need be answered uh, if we really go ahead with the publication of paper. I can answer the next question. I think it's about cost of remote sensing versus helicopter surveys. I think the helicopter surveys that most forestry um, companies do for uh, establishment survey is very different than what we're proposing to do here. Um, I don't know. I, I, I always find that helicopter time can be quite hard to get, especially in a fire year. Um, whereas drones, I mean, it's, it's becoming more accessible. And in terms of cost, I think the, there is a upfront cost of getting the equipment or you can get a, a service provider to collect that data for you. And there's definitely more and more of the, these contract companies out there that would collect data. Um, and you can do, what, two to four well sites per day um, quite effectively with enough battery pack. And if the sites are closer, you can even increase that number. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the, the, the data you get from remote sensing and helicopter survey are very different. But if you compare remote sensing versus boots on the ground plot level survey, I would say that remote sensing is considerably cheaper and more comprehensive. And then the next question is on NVDI decrease during the last, last few years. Could it be increase in drought? Um, I thought about it. But last year was really wet, especially in Grand Prairie. So I am not sure. I mean, this is literally data that Saojin slapped together, not slapped together, but put together the last week. So we haven't really explored the relationship between why we're seeing this drop in NDVI to other climatic variables that would perhaps lead to that decrease. Um, but I mean, for sure, water constraint kind of came to my mind too, but last year was quite wet, especially in that Grand Prairie region. So I'm not sure, really hard to say. Um, and then Ian's question about understory vegetation that confused ground elevation that contributes to underestimation. Is that a problem? Absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. If you don't really know what ground is and therefore that won't definitely give you a bias in terms of height. Um, are you able to detect trees shorter than the understory vegetation? Perhaps only during leap off flights. And I think that's why we did the timing of flights and data collection, because that was a variable that we haven't explored 
especially for um, this region to know whether or not leave off, leave on conditions changes the parameters that we're assessing? Yeah, uh, I think the important thing is that uh, for some areas, definitely, even for the ground measurement, there can be a huge error in some dense areas uh, and with uh, high um, uh, understory vegetation. So um, practically, uh, we are focusing on the recommendation required criteria. So um, there are some problems that may be very challenging, but it may not be practical. Uh, to me, like uh, to understand the uncertainty, like uh, what our ability is and uh, where we can go far from our existing sensors, is more important than we perfecting our data and to extremely you know, get the best results. This is, should be like moving very slowly, but uh, we need to make sure like everything under control. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, height is not currently a reclamation criteria per se, especially for well sites, but certainly it's, it's a metric that we're interested in and that we want to track in terms of long-term monitoring. Um, but perfecting that height and knowing, you know, the plus or minus air that you get from remote sensing, um, to me, it's more about consistency, right? Being able to get that data consistently, because you would still get air when you do plot measurements anyways. I would I would argue that that might be even bigger sometimes because it's more subjective. So yeah. Um, next question, Eric. Can you comment on the performance of Sentinel forest inventory classification tool on larger forest areas and existing large trees? Potential for a backcast to data collected on older uh, we, we haven't done that, uh, but uh, usually there are some packages like uh, LIDR or other, uh, oh, sorry, not LIDR, but uh, some of the um, like, uh, packages that can help us uh, using the remote sensing code for, for that, uh, for, for the ra random forest and those things. And uh, um, it, it's um, basically um, it's the classification can be divided into like a uh, simpler, like for example, just trees or the tree species or tree shape. So those are all the, uh, like we used to have like object based like inclination ways to do the classification tree. But um, to me, um, there are some uh, problems of automating those approach, for example, like without the feature engineering or tuning of the parameters. So those are also a question for, uh, to, to be consistent to deliver our uh, monitoring data. So I, I think uh, uh, we need to consider both ways, like, uh, like to take uh, the best advantage of the, I mean, any method. So, um, so far, I think uh, the, from my observation, the deep learning works better than those uh, traditional classification tools because it doesn't require uh, those input of features and calculation of those feature extractions. And also it can make better use of spatial information. And uh, um, I, I think for the other all the sensors, um, this is what we are uh, trying to achieve, that we need to look at the different data sources and the, to connect those different sensors based on the tree attribute level. So um, sometimes the fusion directly based on store data is difficult, but we can provide some uh, calibrated variables then using that uh, to you know project back to the older sensors. And uh, there are definitely that without uh, much information, then the accuracy will really be low, but at least we have something to grasp and uh, to, to see the trend. So it's not a, like an absolute trend throughout the year, but, but maybe the relative comparison between those years can make sense. So there are a lot of questions relating to that, I, and we are not definitely the best to answer. And but hopefully, like uh, we are moving towards that direction. And I want to mention that the tool uh, can detect those uh, low shrubs, but um, we we need to test those tools uh, into various data sets, and we don't have that kind of perfect benchmarking data sets so far either from the uh, 3D and 2D. So um, I'm not work uh, that uh, further into those uh, 2D data, so I cannot answer perfectly. Uh, but yeah, definitely that's the point we, we need to pay attention to. I don't know if there's any additional questions. I think um, there's no more questions coming up and we can end this session. Uh, thank you all for participating in today's CIF electronic lectures. And once again, thank you very much to Danny and Josing for the great presentation. Bye everyone. Thank you. Cheers.